Good afternoon to you. Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com here. Wednesday now, the 5th of June, 2024. The big story today is the new Euro seasonal guidance coming out being updated, and it still holds on to this idea of a very active Atlantic hurricane season. Probably going to see a down year in the eastern Pacific, especially as well the West Pack. And when that happens, usually the Atlantic Basin sort of takes over. So we'll take a look at that. And then what might be brewing in the tropics over the next several days or so. Some hints of this Central American gyre, the CAG event, might be coming around sooner rather than later. We'll look at all of that and more. All right. Thanks for joining me this afternoon. Let's get started. First, this tweet here from today. Dr. Phil Klotzbach, many other people cited this info as well, but we'll show Dr. Klotzbach because it's directly related to his and his team at Colorado State University's forecast. They look at a lot of this data to help with their forecasting work. So what do we got? Well, the ECMWF still calls for a busy Atlantic hurricane season with 21 named storms, 11 hurricanes, and, and this is huge, the accumulated cyclone energy, or the ACE, at 200% of normal with an ACE of 250. That would rival some of the biggest years ever, like 1933 and 2005 as examples. 2004 was up there with a very high ACE uh, between July and December. So that leaves out the month of June because the model does not forecast for the month that it is in for whatever reason. And uh, Dr. Klotzbach mentions that down in this next part. Note that the ECMWF seasonal forecast model does not include hurricanes forming in the month that it was initialized and runs for the following six months. So this goes through December, and I fully expect that we're going to have activity going past November 30th. So here are the different pieces of this puzzle. We already know. You know what I'm going to tell you? It's the warm water in the Atlantic versus the borderline La Nina that should be coming on. And I'm going to tell you, too, the fact that this La Nina does not look like it's going to be overwhelmingly strong, usually those are the seasons that give us the most headaches. When you don't have something that really throws a strong monkey wrench, so to speak, into the overall process, a strong El Nino or a strong La Nina, those can really upset the balance of things. But these borderline events and even neutral events, when you do have something like a very warm Atlantic, this helps this that scenario really helps this to stick out, so we'll put a big positive there in terms of favorability. That is a positive look when you are looking for the data that says we can have a very busy season. It's a positive correlation. That's another way to put it. So here are some of the different numbers for the different basins of the globe. Kind of a down year in the East Pack, definitely a down year in the West Pack, and a big, robust banner year for the Atlantic. We need to be ready. We need to be thinking about it. We need to take this seriously. We could have societal impacts over a wide area, not just the United States, but all around the Caribbean, up into Atlantic Canada, and even across the big pond, as I mentioned the other day, over into Europe, as recurving cyclones take energy over there. This is a big deal, all right? And we have to be ready as best we can. So looking at 21 named storms, wow. You know, I mean, the norm is 13 and some change. So a big season ahead. And then, of course, the ACE, the accumulated cyclone energy of 250, potentially, that's just incredible. That's the, the quality of the storms and how long they could last. And remember, this does not take into account June. We might get a hurricane somewhere in the Atlantic Basin in June. We still have 25 more days, right? And uh, so from July through December, 11 hurricanes total. That's a lot. You know, that's three more than normal, three more hurricanes than we would normally see. And again, the biggest culprit here, going to keep hammering this, the very warm anomalies in the Atlantic, the developing La Nina, and just the absence of El Nino. I cannot emphasize that enough. Last year we had this very warm Atlantic. We are actually warmer this year than we were last year. And we had this strong El Nino that came on, and that helped to keep things down a bit. Yet we still had over 100 named storm days last year. That is incredible. So with that El Nino gone, and we are quickly headed towards cool neutral to weak La Nina conditions, and the very warm Atlantic relative to average, you've heard us talk about it time and again, and the new Euro seasonal guidance has not backed off at all. So I think all the chips are in for this to be an extraordinary hurricane season. 
and we definitely need to take uh, action ahead of time, whatever that means for you as an individual, as a family, as a community, as a business owner, whatever the case may be, you know, we have to be ready. We can hope that they all stay out to sea, but odds are something's going to get past the goalie, as they say, as I say, whatever. So what does it look like today? Not much going on still. Uh, Gulf of Mexico nice and clear. Uh, a little bit of activity in and around some of the islands down here of the Caribbean. But we are just starting to see some signs down here of a more favorable, especially low-level pattern, as this Central American gyre, just this circulation pattern that sets up. So instead of the trade winds just blowing through uh, straight on, kind of like this, and into the Pacific, with tropical waves embedded in there, this is just an example, and those are the fo focusing mechanisms, you get this wind shift where the winds will come in, and they turn, and they get this sort of gyre look, just a large circulation, and you can sort of focus that somewhere. Maybe a tropical wave arrives on scene to add some energy, and boom, you're off to the races. That's what we're going to be looking for. A lot of times these CAG events, these gyres, are big, spread out, and messy, but then a part of them will kind of break off and consolidate and become maybe something potent. You just never know. But more often than not, they're generally spread out, and you get a big rainmaker out of it. But remember, say it with me, you know it, rain is an impact. And that needs to be taken seriously, too, especially when you get a lot of heavy rain over a big urban area. Um, and, you know, certainly out in just open countryside, whatever. We need to look at rain as one of those main impacts with wind and storm surge all the time. So nothing now, but we are starting to see some signs of change in the model guidance. And you know, when we look at this every day, it does seem like it takes forever. The old watch pot never boils, but it does take time. And we can see some of the energy down here. We use the color white to make it pop better. Starting to get a little bit of vorticity, low-level vorticity down here. A little piece of energy coming off South America. We'll look for any tropical wave energy that might arrive. I don't see any just yet. But that's the area we're going to watch all through down here over the next week to 10 days. And if something were to get going and try to get up into the Gulf of Mexico or around the Yucatan Channel vicinity, yes, water temperatures are very warm. These are the actual temperatures, 28, 29, 30 Celsius. So we're talking mid to upper 80s Fahrenheit. Plenty warm for something to develop and bring the threat of heavy rain, possibly some coastal issues, possibly some wind issues, those are the possibilities. What we don't know, huge question mark, when and where would this set up? Will it be concentrated? Will it be spread out? We don't know. Those are questions that I honestly don't know the answer to just yet. And that's why we look at this at least together. I make these videos available for you. Because like I've said before, this is exactly what I would look at, even without a YouTube and social media audience. So that being said, what do we got out there? Well, the 12Z GFS really starts to amp up that overall pattern change even out at day five you can start to see more of that yellow and orange down there more of that vorticity at the lower levels energy streaming into that off of south america it comes off these mountains down here a very interesting localized phenomenon that can add uh, some little pieces of energy to the overall mix and then it's just a question of does one of these break off and concentrate get into the flow and then turn around with one of these troughs maybe crossing Florida, sometimes they cut more to the south and east, sometimes you get a big ridge that builds in and they come in and then they turn up towards the Gulf, into the Central Gulf, we just don't know. But watching the models here, the operationals and the ensembles, we can get an idea of what might be happening. So let's just take it out to a week. There's the low levels. Again, that's the, that, you couldn't write this any better for me. Look at that, those are your wind barbs. You can just follow my line around there. And there's your huge circulation area, this big gyre that has set up. And then it's just a matter of whether or not something concentrates on it. The other part of this is to look at the upper levels of the atmosphere. What does it look like upstairs, so to speak? Another big key to the puzzle. Large area of anticyclonic flow aloft. So all of this through here, favorable upper level winds, but just to the north, definitely unfavorable. And so if anything were to get up here, it could get sheared. But if it's moving with the flow, maybe not so much shear, all of these details we need to look at. But these bigger pieces to this puzzle are easier to follow. In other words, this very large anticyclone in the upper levels, more 
often than not, that's going to generally be there. Rather than, oh, is there going to actually be a 1,005 millibar low north of Cuba? Those are the details we don't worry about. This larger piece, that continues to grow in the modeling, and uh, as does the lower levels back over here that I was showing you at the 850 level, that's also pretty prevalent. Time and time again, and this is a week out, and you go just beyond that just to kind of show you how it evolves, a really large mess. So we'll see over the next week or so what happens down in the Northwest Caribbean. Uh, the Canadian model, CMC, also showing that general evolution over the next week or so. This one gets more towards the southwestern Gulf, Bay of Campeche area. Lots of energy just kind of spread out over a huge area. But the general idea is the same. But the Euro, though, by the way, this is the Euro last night, the operational. It's not as enthused about it, so to speak. We go out to a week on this one. Uh, right there, and no, it's not nearly as amped up. Uh, again, just a pretty stiff southeasterly flow coming in here with a little bit of a hint of curvature there, but that's about it. And even the euro isn't always right. I know there's that sentiment from a lot of people. Well, unless the euro shows it, I don't believe it. Well, sometimes the euro is late to the party, uh, but the GFS and the Canadian are both generally in the same camp. Is focusing some energy in the Northwest Caribbean. So we're going to want to watch that. There are a lot of interests beyond just, is it going to be a hurricane? We're not just looking for hurricanes, all right? The disturbances can cause issues with crews' uh, interest down there, right? They can cause issues, uh, people trying to sail out of Miami or wherever, going to Cancun, Cozumel, um, whatever the case may be, out of Galveston down to the Caribbean, people that want to fly down to the Cayman Islands, people going to the Florida Keys, whatever the case may be, we want sunshine, butterflies, blue skies, no tropical disturbances, and that's what we're looking for. Do we have something that starts, and then where does it go if we do have something that starts? A couple of the models starting to indicate it more and more that the pattern could be there. Now we see if something comes along to take advantage of that pattern, and we don't know the answer to that just yet. All right? All right. Spoke with my uh, friends up at Quick Dam yesterday. They're up in Pawtucket in Rhode Island. And they brought up a good point. Follow their page, right? <laughs> Here they are on Twitter. They're on Instagram as well, Facebook. You can find them. they got some good YouTube videos as well. So here you go. I talk about them often, but this is their, um, I, I know it's called X, okay? But to me, it's always Twitter. No offense to Mr. Musk. But here they are on, uh, I call it Twitter, formerly known as X. But they're here. And then, of course, their website, quickdams.com, and they post really excellent tutorials and videos of testimonials from customers of actual use of their amazing products and I'll be getting up there later this summer and we're going to do like a couple of hours live from the company headquarters in Pawtucket and just kind of show you exactly what we're talking about. I'm looking forward to do that because of course flooding with the rainfall no matter what it's from is a very expensive and incessant part of any severe weather but especially and up my alley, hurricanes. Hurricanes, tropical cyclones bring a lot of rain. So follow them for good updates and whatnot on social media. You know, they're, they're out there, so check them out. And we still have our tracking maps. Just about everybody who bought one in the last several days to 10 days should have yours by now. Um, I was traveling a lot, so some of them went out later, but they all should be there. And even over in the UK, I heard from Catherine that she got hers over in the United Kingdom. Fantastic. That's great. It's because I'm sending them in these brown envelopes, I think, that they're getting to where they need to be quicker. When I sent them in the poster tubes, they either got crushed, destroyed, lost, or never showed up. I don't know. So I switched over to folding them and putting them in those big brown envelopes, and they're there. I mean, I sent that just a few days ago, and Catherine got hers. She said yesterday on our Discord, hey, I got my map. And that's awesome. So if you want to get one, go to hurricanetrack.com forward slash track map. I drew this myself in Illustrator a long time ago. It's my map. It's my work of art. And you can own a piece of that work of art and hang it on your wall and uh, track this season's storms. And when it's all said and done, you never know. You might end up with quite the historic document. And if the Euro has anything to say about it, you'll have at least 21 named storms. And by the way, let me go back to that graphic real quick. Right there are the list of names for this year. Right there is the auxiliary list. How many tracking maps 
produ- produced by like TV stations and grocery stores these days. I don't know. Maybe you can tell me. But how many of them have those other names on there? Mine does. Just wanted to point that out. Somebody mentioned that to me. They're like, hey, you got those auxiliary names on there. I hear you. You're right. You got to, because we might get into that auxiliary list. Remember, we used to use the Greek alphabet, but after 2020, they're like, nope, that's not going to work anymore. So now there's this preset list of additional names, and those are on the map. Let's hope we don't have to use them, but if you do, you can track them. All right? All right, that is it for me for today from all of us at the Hurricane Track family and community. We appreciate you tuning in. It's great. Follow us, like, share, subscribe on YouTube. You know the drill. We love having you watch the videos, and we love the interactions, so keep it coming. I am Mark Suddeth. I'll be back. I'll keep it coming. I'll be back with more for you tomorrow.